Hello, everybody. This is a great Johannes speaking again. Johannes Mathis Conrad. Uh, I've decided to do live streams almost every day now, aiming for about one hour of content or so. So I'm still trying out different formats to see uh, what I enjoy doing, what my audience enjoys, uh, you know, interacting with. You can follow me on on TikTok at the Great Johannes, or you can go to my YouTube with the same username at the Great Johannes. Or get my subscription at www.jmk.info. That's my Substack system over there. Uh, I see some people coming into the live stream. As usual, it takes about two minutes before I get sent out. Today, what I want to do is uh, I like learning from other people. Also from foreign people, right? So I'm going to go through uh, this guy's TikTok channel. He's made a whole bunch of videos reflecting on Asia, reflecting on the Western world and so on. And why not Why not simply watch his videos and then comment on, have me comment on uh, well, what I think of it, you know? This is a bit of a, a bit of a easier setup for me so I can uh, have some more to talk to, talk about. Hello from Ireland, brother, Dimitri D. Uh, actually, before I start uh, going through this program, uh, I noticed that in the Western world, everybody should be noticing this. We have more and more and more ethnic leaders, but are they really elected or carried by the people? Such as Rishi Sunak famously was not elected by the people. They voted for Liz Truss, right? The other one. So they get Sunak now. And they have one Leo Varadkar in uh, Ireland. And they have whoever in Scotland. And they have, uh, they're going to do the Vivek guy in the USA, people are actually considering voting Vivek over Trump. What are you doing? You know, you're you're handing your power away to ethnic looking people. But of course, these people are not really uh, uh, supported by the majorities. They are also pushed into these positions by others. You really notice that Sunak, Rishi Sunak, for example, has no power whatsoever. He's just a puppet on a string like Pinocchio. And the same with Vivek, the same with uh, all these strangely um, uh, you know, ethnic people. There's a mayor in Ireland. Uh, I forgot his name. Azad, blah, blah, blah. Some kind of guy from Beng a Bengali mayor, apparently, in the town of Limerick in Ireland, who, uh, who felt that uh, he wanted to have the rioters who rioted after the Dublin uh, knife attack, he wanted them shot in the head or beaten to death in public. He just said so. You know, it's just, it's just really extreme what they get away with, whereas... A uh, much nicer fellow, Conor McGregor, the fighter, when he has some comments, he has some things to say about the rioters, meaning he supports them. You know, he gets a police investigation because he's white. See, so a brown mayor who can't even speak English. I speak better English than this guy. And, and he can say that he wants to have the white rioters shot in the head or beaten to death in public. And he gets away with it. It's just nuts, you know. Anyway, uh, for today's show, what I really want to do was uh, go over uh, this guy. He has a TikTok channel. So I'm just going to listen to some of his videos and then give you my commentary because he, he is quite smart, but he gives you like the Asian perspective on Europe, which is uh, healthy for us to also investigate how do other people perceive us and how do they explain their own society, right? So... Uh, yeah, hello from Mississippi and a good day from Seattle, Washington. It's amazing that people from all over the world are tuning in, right? So I'm going to play here. I hope the sound is going to come through properly. This is classic neocon fear-mongering. Oh, we, America, saved the world from World War II. We protect the world from devastation. We protect human rights and rule of law. Well, jokes on this neocon, modern Germany applies by international law and human rights. I'm going to pause it here already a little bit. Like the comment says, uh, meaning it's a U.S. person, writes, we, we tried letting other people control the world, but of course, it's not quite true. Like, and then Germany tried to take over twice. Now, Germany was asserting its regional dominance over Russia, really. They were trying to invade Russia. And eventually the Russians, of course, beat the Germans. The, the Americans had nothing to do with it. The Americans came in near the end of that war, 1944, D-Day, right? They took over Western Europe, basically colonized Western Europe. They took Germany. 
you know, Western Germany. And ever since the CIA has an office in Frankfurt, basically controlling the, the whole European narrative and also the Euro European Union by now, because the EU was co-founded by the US State Department, by the CIA. They paid for the European Union to be imposed on us, right? So it's all very different. Uh, well, let's, Way let's more hear than some America more. Does. So if anything, Germany should protect and enforce international law, not America, because they have the creds. Likewise with Japan. Now I know I made a video criticizing Japanese culture, but no culture is perfect. And the fact of the matter is Japan now adheres to international law. Again, more so than America does, or Israel. So maybe we gotta let the Boeing, Raytheon, and Lockheed Martin stocks go down a little bit, or a lot, so we can, I don't know, stop violating international law, stop wasting trillions of dollars on bases. This is the same logic that got America into Iraq. Lies and fear-mongering by neocon. Yeah, I suppose that's largely true, though. Because this is something I, as a European, always think about very often. Like, the U.S. dominance over Europe since World War II uh, has basically uh, submitted Europe, European interests, to American interests. It's America first, literally. But it's, it's not something Trump invented. This has been going on for far longer. And... Um, but it can't stay that way forever. The U.S. war machinery is so expensive to maintain if they, you know, this is why they have to do those wars, wars for oil, wars for energy, wars for gas, and so on, without which you cannot fund your military, without which you will not be able to control Europe any longer, for example. Uh, you will not be able to bully the world into doing what you need them to do just to stay on top. And I think the United States finds itself now in this sort of death struggle where uh, where they need to keep waging more wars to stay on top, but they're only doing it to stay on top. There's no greater narrative anymore, no higher motivation. No, you know, the, ideologically, you say you are democratic and progressive and liberal, and you're supporting the LGBT and so on. These are things the world doesn't really care about. Most of the world is authoritarian, conservative, and they don't give a fuck about LGBT. So the fact that you're promoting this so hard you know, is weird to the point where people don't even want to join the U.S. military anymore because they, they don't want to be celebrating someone's trans birthday or whatever, you know, it's just weird. Thanks for your work, man, says someone here. Greetings from Poland. Yeah, very nice. The USA is Zionist ruled. Yeah, that's quite, quite obvious. It's Zog, right? Zionist occupied government. But then by extension, by extension, so is Europe. The European Union is also Zog, you know. Uh, someone asks, have you seen the Republic presidential debate on NBC? Non-stop pure war language against China. Yeah, I haven't seen it, but it makes sense because the EU is in a death struggle with the rising star China. China uh, may overtake the US economy and then they may actually be able to build an army more powerful than that of the USA. You know, they may even send Chinese astronauts to the moon someday for real. You know, and that's that's a real problem. Uh, let me just listen to one more one more of this guy's videos to see what he has to say about other topics. So you know? this is just a quick rant. For some reason in the West, particularly in America, being smart and being nerdy is frowned upon and made fun of. You're bullied for being a nerd. And when you try to talk about these complicated topics and explain them in a nuanced way, people just roll their eyes and say, why are you overcomplicating things, man? Because it reminds them of going to school. And we all know how miserable school is. But my biggest fear is the dumbing down of future generations. And it's already happening. Gen Alpha can't even read. And sometimes it's the same people. Yeah, but why can't Gen Alpha read in the USA? Guess why? Because of immigration. Uh, only half, only 50% of Gen Alpha kids are white people. And they didn't suddenly stop reading. They didn't lose their reading skills. It's the others, the immigrants coming at you through the birth canal canal through the sorry through the birth canal and through uh, through your open borders that's those people are unable to read and write <laughs> so you're importing illiterates and and you get illiterates you know import the third world get the third world that's just how it is and yeah so is it really a dumbing down of of future generations as though whites and asians in the usa somehow can't read anymore that's not true it's not a dumbing down of generations technically what is going on is uh, a replacement. You're replacing the more competent 
demographic with the less competent demographic because you bought into the equality nonsense. You convinced yourself that everybody's equal, so we're all equally intelligent. Therefore, it doesn't matter what skin color you have. Turns out it does matter what race you are. Well, that want to rebel against the elite. Well, how can you rebel against the elite if they're way smarter than you? If you don't want to even engage your mind intellectually and challenge the thoughts of the elite. This whole shaming of being smart, it's not a good thing for society. So this is just a quick rant. For some yeah, that's a good point. Like the whole shaming of being smart. I, I, I reckon it's actually the other way around also, uh, especially in the USA, I would say it's the, the worshiping of stupid people like Kamala Harris or George Floyd, you know, people who really have with very low cognitive abilities, you put them on a pedestal, you, you give them a statue, for example, while you tear down the statues of truly visionary, incredible men, right? And you, you replace them with these dumbasses because, because of what? Because you're really worshiping stupid or you think, you think that's going to make them smarter or something? Someone told me if we gave African-Americans more money, they would become more smart. No, they just want more money. <laughs> We'd be stupid to go along with things like that. The whole reparation scheme is a scam. It's a Nigerian scam. Right? We're not going to give them any money. Why would we do that? If they want to have uh, a powerful civilization, then the Africans in Central Africa can do that on their own in Central Africa. They always say they have the resources, don't they? Right? We didn't steal all their resources. Their resources are still in Africa. So w w what about that, you know? Here, someone says, uh, bravo, Mario, says, we have to stop apologizing for being white. Yeah, we have to be pride, proud and stop feeling guilty, basically. No guilt. Just stop feeling guilty, you know. You know, here, uh, someone says, Verenikov says, uh, mass immigration and the things they teach in school, you know, they're all communists. Yeah, that's probably true. The, the people who have taken over the Western schooling system, yeah, they're, they're just communist socialists who really believe we're all equal. It's not just something they say. They really believe that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not literally. Okay. Don't be racist. Somebody actually said that in my comments. Get lost. Bye. So, uh... Let's go to another uh, video of this guy. This is a very good point. This is so why a lot of economists no, support... Don't care about this no, one. I mentioned Sorry. this in a lot of previous ah. videos before. The reason why Asians are so submissive is because of Confucianism. You are taught to obey and to be loyal to your parents, to be yes. a slave to your parents, and to never cause anyone trouble. I have to repeat that exactly. Under Confucianism in East Asia, you are literally taught to be a slave to your parents. This is a concept not well understood in the Western world. Although we do have that biblical commandment of uh, honor thy father and thy mother. We have it too, but not at all to the extent you cannot. If you are born white in Europe or, or in the USA, you cannot imagine how slavish Asian young people have to be to the elder generations. We in the West put our old people in elderly homes. We move them out, so to speak, like, see ya, bye, right? Whereas in Asia, they move in with you and you have to take care of them until they die. Uh, you have no idea how, how submissive. This is so true. Whereas with white people, they are taught to be leaders. They're taught to be confident. They're taught to not give a fuck. Sometimes to the point where they're so inconsiderate and they still don't give a fuck. Like I've seen so many white people literally just stop their car in the middle of the road just to say hi to someone <laughs> and then block all traffic. Like that's the most <laughs> inconsiderate thing you could possibly do. But yet they don't give a fuck because that's their mentality. That's so true. That's also why Asians have the stereotype of being smart because Confucianism values scholarship and education. So while in the West, being smart is considered weird and nerdy, in Asia, being the smartest kid in your class with the best grades is like being the top football player in your school. The nerds are the jocks in Asia, so they can be their parents' retirement plan. So I mentioned this... Oh, did you hear that last point? The nerds in Asia are the jocks, meaning they have high status so they can take care of their parents, right? We dump our old parents in asylum uh, elderly homes and they actually, after being successful, after having a good job, now they get to have to take care of their parents. It means your whole social organization is designed to submit the young to the generations above you. And... uh I think he's going to talk more about this in another video, but it probably has something to do with this. 
we always talk about the big racial differences in terms of IQ and intelligence, right? But what about domestication? There's differences in domestication. The uh, Asian, East Asian people are, seem to be the most domesticated people in the world. You might use the, world's, the word civilized for it, civilization. So you can say, okay, East Asian people are most civilized in terms, in the sense of domestication. White people, quite domesticated, but not so much, not to the point of the East Asians. And of course, African black people, they're wild, they're out of control, they're not domesticated at all, right? They're not civilized in this sense, in the sense of domestication. But, you know, think of what we do to children. We stick, we stick children in schools during the day. The, the undomesticated, the wilder people obviously don't belong there. This is totally unhealthy, it goes against their nature. Whereas the more domesticated people, say the Asian people, to them it is also almost more natural, uh, desirable to be in a classroom, right? And again, white people here seem to be um, somewhat in the middle of these two worlds. Um, I suppose what I want to explain is Asian, Asia has traditionally always had the larger populations. Today, they have like 5 billion people in Asia, if you include India, that's about 5 billion people. So the, almost the, the majority of people living in the world today, alive today, lives in Southeast Asia, in that circ sort of circle they have there that contains 5 billion people, including China, India, and other parts, right? And because of their numbers, uh, you need a very rigid social organization. They are a grain-based water, a hydraulic society. It means that um, they manage the flow of water to these rice fields, which allows them to have very large numbers of people, but only in a very submissive state. You have to obey the masters, the, organ the organizers of the, of the waterways, of the water flow, so to speak. In Europe, it's very different. Even in feudal times, feudal kings could barely muster up an army of, say, two or 3,000 men. Maybe 8,000 8, men armies were, would have been considered large in the, in the feudal European times. Because in European feudal times, peasants often minded their own business, and you could not easily get them to fight for you. The peasants just refused to fight. You had to have professional warriors, whereas in Asia you could have these massive armies of people uh, simply commanded from above, you must fight now. You, can, you would have like a million peasants fighting for you easily. Uh, it means also that in order to manage these very large numbers of people in Asia, you have to make them much, much more submissive. You know, uh, Someone says, keep up this show. He has to go. Okay, see ya. You know, the Asians are just really nice people. I know lots of them. So chill. Yeah, well, that's the submissive nature of them, right? I think... Uh, white people are more aggressive and more inconsiderate, and black people, of course, are off the charts in these terms. Yeah, agricultural revolution long before Europe. I think the Asians for the past, uh, let's say, 20,000 years or so, they have been feeding themselves with grain-based diets. So they actually evolved for grain eating. So one might assume they actually started doing the, the rice stuff long before Europeans ever did. Because Europeans, my ancestors, they lived on, just 2,000 years ago, they were living on a diet of meat and dairy added with some berries and nuts, but they did not. We did not eat cereals or grains and so on. This is totally new to us. This is also why I, myself, uh, eat more and more of a... Uh, 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 meat and dairy because it's just so much more conducive to my intestines uh, when I notice if I eat meat and dairy diets it, I digest it so very quickly and I, I have a lot of energy whereas if I eat a lot of pasta or so or a lot of vegetables what happens is it takes way more time to digest it and it makes me sleepy I need a whole hour like mm, to digest the food you know what do you mean black people are off the charge? Well, in terms of aggression and rape and so on, you know, they're off the charge. They're not controllable. Do you believe African-American people are descendants of Cain from the Bible? No, I don't believe in, I don't think the Bible tells you the historical truth. So I don't believe in that one. You know, I like it. Let's watch some more videos of this guy. So this is a very good question. But first, I want to say something that's going to surprise a lot of Westerners. Human rights is not the same as democracy. Human rights is stating that all men are created equal and all men have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
and also the right to own property. But democracy is letting people vote, technically the rule by the majority. But you might think letting the people vote and having the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, isn't that the same thing? No. Because what if the majority of people vote for racist, misogynistic, patriarchal, xenophobic, or transphobic laws or people? If the majority of the people in the country like that, that's a democracy. But that's not human rights. <laughs> I beg to differ. I, I would say that patriarchy is voting for something like a patriarchy is, is perfectly in line with human rights. I would say feminism goes against human rights. I would say also the old trans LGBT movement goes against human rights. So again, human rights are not universal. I think that's, uh, he's obviously a sort of a leftist, but saying that, like assuming that human rights is some, some kind of objective universal ideal that everybody must know about, that's so typically leftist that it isn't so especially if you would accept that people aren't equal if, say, the Asians and the Europeans are actually different kinds of people with different diets and different histories, you might say that what's best for Europeans isn't what's best for Asians, meaning that human rights cannot be defined in any universal manner. Rather, you would have to have human rights for Europeans and human rights for Asians, but these would be two different sets of human rights, each to their own, basically. Look at all these so-called democracies that are not the best with protecting human rights and human freedoms. Like a lot of Eastern Europe, Turkey, every far right and nationalist government out there. Yeah, they're doing what the people want. But sometimes in those cases, the people don't want equal opportunity for all races. No, why would we want that? There is no equal qualification of all people. Individuals are different. Groups of individuals are different. You know, this guy likes to refer to the authority of universal principles, but forgets to question those universal principles. They aren't universal. And so the difference here is rule of law, specifically the rule of human rights. And you can have rule of law and rule of human rights without a democracy, because democracy is actually voting for charisma. Okay, so here, here you go. This is the Chinese argument against democracy. The Chinese say, well, democracy, you know, doesn't lead to the best outcome anyway. Why not install a communist party telling people how to behave? And if they know what the universal rights are, and if they, you know, aspire to impose these onto the people, then therefore autocracy, autocratic rule of a communist party is also right. And that's just bullshit. Someone asks, how do LGBT rights go against human rights? Uh, both of them are, first of all, subjective. There's no such thing as human rights. It's just made up anyway. But LGBT is usually caused by abuse, child abuse. And no one has the right to abuse their children. I love you, Johannes. Yeah. So, you know, if people wouldn't abuse their children, I don't believe there would be LGBT. So how can that be a right then? You want to have the right to abuse your children because you were abused and you want to pass it on to your kids? You know, this is like Milo Yiannopoulos saying that he thinks, it, thinks it's all right to rape kids because he was raped as a kid. You know, that's not how human rights work. You don't have the right to abuse people. We should actually support the future generations to becoming strong and healthy again. And that means stop abusing them. You don't have the right to do that, you know. And feminism is basically based on a lie. Feminism is a lie. They... They rewrite the history as though men were always hating on women. But men don't hate women. Men, ha men love women, right? Men uh, throughout history have always sacrificed themselves to support the survival of women and their children. And then to turn that around and say, you men have been oppressive when the men were always the ones sent to war and to die in war. The men were always doing the most dangerous jobs, right? Because the women didn't want to do those jobs. Even today, 99% of truck drivers are men. Why? Because it's boring and women don't want to do boring work. Okay, fine. They don't have to do it. The men will do it. See, you can't say that men hated on women. That's a feminist lie. So the whole idea of feminism is just, just nonsense, you know? It's not actually voting for human rights. Whoever got the most riz is going to win the election. Just look at Donald Trump. He got the grab her by the pussy riz. Because as long as there's a strict enforcement of the rule of law, like a strict constitution that embeds the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, then even if... Oh, <laughs> the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was edited by largely just one person who came up with it, and he was Jewish. So you want to submit your whole life 
to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was largely invented by one man, by the way, not a woman. Politicians aren't directly voted by the people. They are still forced to abide by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and they're forced to abide by that rule of law. So to answer this question, that rule of law would not only allow pluralism, but require it. Without the need for a direct vote, it actually makes more sense to vote for laws and policies instead of voting for people, because people are fake, especially public. Yeah, again, this is the Chinese argument against democracy. It says, in the West, we vote for charisma, for leaders, right? But in Asia, they, they don't vote or they simply go, they, they uh, choose the, the best policies or something. Again, you're making a bit of a mistake there. You're assuming that there is such a, a thing as a perfect policy that people must vote for. And if you don't vote for it, you're an extremist or you're wrong or you're fascist or you're patriarch and so on. So that's a bit of a strange thing, you know. Uh, someone asks, username dot, <laughs> do you find re repatriation a valid position? Millions of people with citizenship deported based on blood quantum laws. Now, I'm not going to do that based on, on blood. But you can basically look at someone's face and their last name. That should tell you everything, right? If you're not contributing or something to society. Uh, deportation should always be possible. Repatriation should always be possible, yeah. yeah. Someone's grandma is Jewish. That's a shock. <laughs> you know, lots of Jewish people escaped persecution in the Second World War simply by changing their last name. They don't talk about it or by changing their last name and then posing as Catholics, and they got away with it. So we don't talk about that very often. Uh, rule by algorithm. Yeah, rule by algorithm. Yeah, that's a clever idea. Who's going to program the algorithm? I'm a pretty good programmer. Why don't let me let me program the algorithm? I bet if you came up with rule by algorithm, uh, some people will be smart enough to hack the algorithm, either through changing your behavior in such a way that you will get the outcomes from the machine that you want, or, or by simply tricking it or hacking it some other way, you know. Do you think Geert Wilders will allow a South African Dutch to be, come to the Netherlands? Probably not. He's probably going to get more Turkish people, Muslims, and so on. Because he's, he's, he's obviously an asshole, you know. He's controlled opposition. So, the username of this guy, you want to see him? Oh, I forgot what the name was. Or oh, here it is. Kawalang Dawl... Kawalang <laughs> Figure it out. You want me to post this guy's username? I can do that. I think if I can copy paste it into it. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that's too much. Wait, I'll type it out. This guy's username. I'm re I'm reviewing his uh, Kawalang Dalawahan. Let me check that. <laughs> this is insane, man. Kawalang Kawalang Dalawahan. This is supposed to be his username. Uh, well, let's hit play for a bit. Politicians, why would you trust them? So to summarize, democracy and human rights are not the same thing. Because democracy is just ruled by Riz. And if the people don't support human rights, they're not going to vote for human rights. So what would that alternative to democracy look like? A dictatorship? Look at Singapore, for example. Yeah, it's not a democracy. But they have human rights. They make sure all ethnicities are protected under the law. And that's why it's one of those few countries that is in America that's not an ethno state. Unlike. Yeah, that's not quite true. I actually spoke to. Uh, no, I didn't speak to him, but I was in a, in a meeting with the, a former uh, foreign minister of Singapore, the country just mentioned. And although they do kind of treat each eth ethnic the same, uh, they would never allow mass immigration from, of people from outside of Singapore. They would never allow that. They basically take care of the people who are there, in this sense, comparable to what Russia does. You know, take care of your many different nationalities, which is what Europe should do. We should be supporting our different nationalities without allowing mass immigration from outside of the EU. That's what Singapore actually does. You, do you think a million white people can just move to Singapore? You'd be dead wrong. You can't do that. They wouldn't allow it. They are f very right-wing in this sense. They're very authoritarian. Also, you know... It's other. This guy keeps, keeps talking about human rights as, as though that is a real universal objective thing, as though it was chiseled in stone by Moses himself or something. But precisely that doesn't exist. But what's my point of view? What's my, what is my uh, opinion on democracy? Uh, for Europeans, 
abolish it and we need to reinstate something like an aristocracy you know just like this guy says they don't have a democracy in singapore or in many asian countries like china right and they simply impose what they believe is best for people you know what we need in europe is a sort of aristocratic elite who are not tied to the big corporations but rather to the land so that they are willing to fight for the quality of their people in a sense and then we can also do away with democracy right but our human rights or sorry our version of human rights will be something that comes from within the people rather than something that is imposed on us by i don't know asian intellectuals or someone it just doesn't work like that you know someone asks here jared marma asks how is the house of orange doing in the netherlands i think the people still like them although our king is a bit weak you know he's the most noble man of europe he has like uh 32 uh now like his his parents his grandparents great great grandparents and great great grandparents and so on are all our royalty have, have all been uh, nobility so he's the most noble man in europe and yet he's uh he's not very masculine he's not very strong he doesn't really achieve much does he no he doesn't have any power so to speak you know neighbors like malaysia and china okay i'm because gonna move to the next video by this guy so as a perennial advice right, no this is uninteresting what's so this as one? someone with leftist values such as lgbtq rights feminism egalitarianism universal health care universal education including at the college level and the nordic model for social democracy i've noticed something hypocritical about the left they claim all cultures are equal but yet when they encounter someone racist sexist, misogynistic, homophobic, xenophobic, ableist, transphobic, or any other kind of bigotry, they have zero tolerance for that and they will cancel them. And rightfully so, because they're bigots. <laughs> but wait, didn't you just say that all cultures are equal? So is a culture that's homophobic, transphobic, misogynistic... Is a culture that abuses children equal? No, it's not. Is a culture that abuses children and in the process produces a lot of the LGBT phenomena equal to a society that makes its children strong and healthy? No, of course not. You know, this is another thing about modern societies. They are all on a um, downhill trajectory in terms of support of the young, right? First, the society starts with total support of the young and then this support slowly diminishes as the older generations start basically uh, uh, harvesting the souls of the young, so to speak, you know, and that's just what's wrong. Uh, ABM asks, what do you think about the European diaspora? Should they be, should they return to Europe? They should be allowed to return to Europe. We're going to eventually need uh, a lot more of our own people here if we want to retake uh, Europe, unless we, you want to be flooded by people from India or people from the Muslim world or from Central Africa, we're going to have to make a last stand in Europe and decide also what exactly we do what exactly do we want to defend do we need to take germany and northern europe for example or should we defend western europe only and leave eastern europe to what and that's the question you know highly patriarchal elitist is someone says we should get rid of, rid of borders and governments no of course not a people have a territory where they live so they have a language there and their own culture and this you may defend ableist, tribalist, or any other kind of bigotry out there, are you claiming that those cultures are really equal to cultures that are feminist, support LGBTQ rights, supports and believes in mental health, egalitarianism? If you believe in mental health, you literally oppose LGBTQ because this is a mental health condition. You are abusing children, giving them these phenomena, and then telling them that they were born that way. It's extremely abusive fighting for the downtrodden and the freedom to be yourself. Okay, I want to talk about egalitarianism. If you have egalitarianism, you know, you mean equal outcomes rather than equal starting positions. But what if people are actually different? I myself, for example, wouldn't care to be an Olympic swimmer. So someone who is actually good at swimming, swimming should perhaps have my place at the Olympics games for swimming, right? But I shouldn't be there. I like to do other things, right? So instead of giving everybody equal opportunities what you should be doing is giving everybody appropriate opportunities give them the opportunities that match their abilities and their talents but surely 
develop those talents. And this is what we don't do. We give people equal opportunities, and then when things go wrong and they do not achieve equal outcomes, then we say that we still, we still have a fascist society, and that's just not true. What is really going on is nobody bothers even to develop the talents of people, because if you would do that, if you would, if you would, um, if you would grow people's talents and abilities, you would find out how different everybody really is. You would start to notice. Only by ignoring people's innate talents do we make people more equal, right? And that's just wrong. It's just so wrong. Self, are those cultures really equal? No, apparently not. Yes, this is true. But this is the case for every single nation on Earth. And it's been like that for all 200,000 years of human history. Because for most of our history, we were a bunch of warring clans and tribes fighting for survival. It was all a zero-sum game. So, way too many times in history, tribes this would literally true. genocide against the opposing tribe to make room for land for their grazing and other hunter-gatherer stuff. It's been like that for human history. That's just the animal side of humans, because humans are animals after all, as much as people don't want to believe. It's like when you see videos of a bear or a lion. Yeah, I don't think humans are animal, bro. Kind of, kind of more advanced than that. And attacking a poor little innocent deer. Is that animal cruelty? Or is it animal cruelty to stop those bears and lions from attacking and eating that deer? Because you just took away that bear and lion's food. And those bears and lions could starve to death. So life isn't just black and white, good and evil. Life can't be explained with dualism. We are all Wait. sinners. All right, this is a good video. I kind of support this message. Don't know why he was so leftist in the other videos, but now all of a sudden he does seem to support something like, uh, you know, uh, you know, the struggle, the Darwinian struggle, you know, the competition of the of the best or the strongest, you know. America was built on genocide and massacre. The comment in this video said that's actually not true. The uh, the Americans, North and uh, South Americans, were already dying due to the collapse of their own uh, economies. And it is this is the reason why the Europeans were able to to take these continents is because the locals living there were already messing up. People always misunderstand this. Also, uh, and so it wasn't even uh, like uh, the flu or something or uh, diseases the Europeans brought because Europeans are always diseased, as everybody knows. That's also not true. The Europeans simply happened to arrive to the Americas in a time when the local civilizations were already dying out on their own. They were having a period of economic decline and collapse and starvation. You could argue that the Latin Americans largely simply starved to death through no fault of the Europeans who just happened to arrive at that time. And the North Americans, they were doing cattle farming or something. And it didn't work out for them. Well, so big deal, you know. You can't say that, that Europeans were genocidal massacres. It's just not true, but it's an absolute lie. Yes. This but, okay. Other than that, this was a pretty good video because, you know, everybody does this. How did the Asians eventually occupy Asia? They genocided the people who were there before, you know. How did the modern Japanese get to live in Japan? They genocided the people who lived there before, you know. <laughs> it's duh. So I'm noticing a lot of racist comments on my comments. All right, this has got to be an interesting video. The race war between Asians and black African-Americans. A lot of which are from people who identify as black. So I just want to shed light on this race war between the Asian-American community and the black American community. Yes, there is racism on both sides. But what do we have in common other than being both discriminated minorities? We are both American. And America was founded on multiculturalism and diversity. That's why multiculturalism works so well in America, and really only in America. Whereas in other countries like Europe and Asia, multiculturalism doesn't work so well, because those places weren't founded on the value of multiculturalism. Yeah, I totally agree with this. This is very insightful. You know, I thought he was a hardcore leftist, but actually he also has some interesting points of view here. They were ethnostates. America is not an ethnostate. And a lot of white... Uh, is not an ethnostate? Well, it was an ethnostate. The United States was founded for the WASP people, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And in the beginnings, not even the Catholics were welcome. They were driven out, actually. The Hispanics, who were actually first in uh, places like New Mexico or Los Angeles, uh, they were Catholics, see? And so the, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, of course, drove the Hispanics away to take their land, to take, 
you know, Los Angeles and so on, uh, California. Uh, and that's largely because, uh, you know, the Protestants and, and the Catholics don't really mix, certainly not in those days. Leftists think it's the white majority oppressors versus the minority oppressed. But clearly there's a race war within the minority oppressed. And it's tearing apart the very yes. foundation of what America was built on. We are one human race after all. So I'm noticing a lot of... Yeah, we're not one human race, though. I mean, what do you, see, what do you expect? That why wouldn't Asians and Negroes like each other more? <laughs> There's a physical difference, right? The Asians are physically weaker, so they feel dominated. But then again, the Asians are mentally superior to the Negroes, so... I mean, what do you expect? You know, of course they don't like each other. I find it adorable how people like this person get no. this audio tape. I'm not going to watch every video of this guy, but going to watch. Uh... To oh, this is interesting. In the West, that samurai are somehow like knights with a code of chivalry, and somehow that equivalent is Bushido. But Bushido is not what you think it is. Bushido is pretty much absolute loyalty to oh. your lord, to your daimyo. Think about it. Why was Japan so brutal during World War II? It's almost like they had a culture of militarism because of the samurai. In fact, many of the generals in Imperial Japan were samurai, or at least they came from samurai families. Even the notorious Hideki Tojo. He himself was from a samurai family. So the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy were just a bunch of samurai doing what samurai do. Interesting. And here's a chilling fact about the samurai you probably don't know. The culture of head taking. That was considered wow. the highest honor and proof that you slain an enemy. And the more powerful the enemy was, the more valuable the head. And they mm. made sure the head was so presentable, <clears throat> so they cleaned it up and made it look really pretty and nice. So the samurai could present it to their lord to show proof that they slayed a fierce... Wow, very interesting history so far. So he's saying that the sort of men, people in charge of Imperial Japan fighting the, the Americans, for example, are, were actually the descendants of the samurai continuing what they were always doing anyway, meaning being in charge and killing people. Enemy. Why do you think Japan is so well known for its shonen? It's all influenced by samurai culture. And the infamous Banzai charge took inspiration from Saigo Takamori, who when faced with defeat, instead of surrendering, gave it all he got. That's why you tend to see in anime, when the main character feels so overpowered, they just give it their all. And that's exactly how the Imperial Japanese Army and the Imperial Japanese Navy felt when they were fighting Americans. It's literally like as if they were in an anime, fighting a villain so powerful that they couldn't possibly win. And that's exactly what America was. So obviously you could put yourself in that main character mentality and you can imagine the kind of thoughts in their head when these soldiers were bonsai charging towards their death, towards a storm of bullets. Yeah, this is all pretty graphic and gruesome. What do you expect? It's about the samurai. And the Sengoku Jidai, Japan's warring states period, basically an all out samurai melee, was extremely, extremely brutal and gory and bloody. When a samurai clan invaded their rivaling daimyo's prefecture, they not only completely routed the enemy, but all of its inhabitants as well. That's the true face of the samurai. And again, the West likes to throw these words like, do it for honor, it's for honor. But do you know what honor means? Honor is fame, honor is reputation. And how do you gain the best reputation? It's just like in an anime, by slaying as many people as possible, specific- Yeah. Okay, this is very interesting. They have uh, basically he explains that Japan had an extremely brutal upper class willing to fight. We would call that with uh, in a phrase in Europe, we would call it the fighting nobility or the blood nobility. And Europe also used to have such a thing. Uh, here's someone, uh, who was it? Italian Stallion says the US is a lost cause and we need to cleanse Europe and rebuild. Yes. But you can't do that unless you have an actual brutal upper, upper class, a fighting nobility, willing to do what is necessary for one's survival. And in the Western world, at least, maybe also in the world at large, we have seen this gradual development toward a very timid, tame leadership, right? We have these happy, flappy socialists and their weak hands and so on. And they will never do what's right. 
their only interest is simply expanding humanity, right? To, to grow humanity to 100 trillion inhabitants on Earth. We will all be stacked like termites living in, living in termite colonies in the big cities. Basically, the Blade, Lar the Blade Runner nightmare scenario that we will be stuck in. Uh, maybe we shouldn't want this, you know? <laughs> maybe there are better things, uh, better things to do. Huh? I think, in a way, it may return that these brutal upper classes may win power again in the near future in Europe, for example, because we, we in Europe are going to have a clash with Islam. We're going to have a clash with the immigrants. We're going to clash, have a clash between the young and the old even because Europe has way too many old people that the young don't want to take care of anymore. And unlike in Asia, we don't have a culture of submission to the elderly. Certainly not if the young are increasingly foreign. And why would they care about an old white boomer class that they would rather get rid of to take their pension funds, right? So... So that's just how it is, you know. Uh, I'm going to watch the next Seven one. reasons why women prefer white men. Number one. <laughs> yeah, I can testify. I get a lot of interest from uh, ethnic women, but, you know, I'm not personally keen on them. Yeah. Colonialism. I don't think I need to explain that. Number two. White men were never brought up in a culture of arranged marriages. So because a wife isn't guaranteed by your parents, white men have to work a lot harder and put a lot more riz into getting women. Because white people were brought up in a culture where marriage was all about love, as opposed to other way more traditional cultures where marriage was about an agreement between two families or a continuation of the father's bloodline. I know, sounds very patriarchal, right? Which brings me to reason number three, feminism. Now, you might think that feminism is actually feminizing men, but that applies only to low-value men. But for high-value men, because women in feminist societies are more liberated and free, they're also more assertive. And so a man has to be even more assertive, even more masculine, to win that woman over. Number four. White I suppose he's right about that, right? Yeah. It's a battle of the sexes in, its, in the sense that we're not becoming more equal. We're simply becoming more ruthless toward each other and some some win that battle and some don't men are taught to be leaders as opposed to asian men like me who are taught to be <laughs> only uh, rg bay rgb says only problem with ethnic women is that they're ethnic <laughs> yes. followers obedient followers and this is due to white men being exposed to an individualistic culture for far longer than other ethnicities and societies and so it's that individualism and that leadership mentality that make women more attracted to white men. Number five, white men are physically and objectively more attractive. They have a... <laughs> mm, I don't know. Physically, are, we, are, we, are white men physically more attractive? We're bigger and stronger than the Asians. But then I think this is also the reason why many white women like some black men. They like the ones who are muscular. The only reason white women like black men is if they're big and muscular. And that's the only reason. A way more defined and chiseled jawline, as opposed to an Asian guy like me. Look, I have no jawline. Yeah, neither and for do those I. Those of you that say just mew, <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't bother work for anybody me because my jaw is literally like dislocated or something. Like I don't know what's wrong with it. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next video. It was pretty Actually, funny though. Actually, it was Zoroastrianism. There's no, I don't care about. So this I'm song. gonna say it louder for a lot of the ignorant Americans in the back. Not trying to call this person out, by the way. And it's the fact that. Being yourself is a Western concept. It's an individualist concept that a lot. Perhaps feature-wise, uh, European people. I, when, I, when I judge judging women, I would say fe the facial features. Yeah, the white women are most beautiful. Clearly, a lot of non-Western countries don't have because non-Western countries value conformity and collectivism, being a team player. And in a team, there's no I. So the whole just stand up for what you believe, fight for what you believe. That's what we call guilt culture. Because when you fail to fight for what you believe, you feel guilty for betraying your own values. But in most of the world, they abide by a whole completely different set of values called shame culture. Shame. Exactly. I made a video about this on an account that got banned where I explained the difference. Europeans live by a guilt culture. We feel bad for doing something bad, right? Whereas almost everybody else in the rest of the world, they evolved to feel shame. It's a very different, very, very different thing. For example, you can't really punish uh, criminals in the West 
foreign criminals, immigrants, in the same way that you punish the white people. Because white people, when they get caught, they feel guilty. Whereas other people, when they get caught, they don't feel shame because their families still love them, so they don't feel any shame and they don't feel guilt. So you can't punish them in the same way. Human culture is basically saving face, having the best possible image and best possible reputation as much as possible. And a lot of Westerners will ignorantly just call it honor. I'm going to bring honor to my family. But for all you Americans out there and other Westerners, do you know what honor actually means? Honor is your image. It's your reputation. If you bring dishonor, you bring shame. The West calls that not a bad look. The rest of right, right. The Western concept of honor, in my view, is different. Honor to us would be doing, uh, a, being prepared to do a heroic act for your people. Then you would have honor. An honorable man fights and wins, for so to speak. So it's, it's not so much about reputation. It's okay to fail as long as you then, you know. I don't know. Let's listen to more. The world calls that being a dishonor or a shame. So the West would consider shame culture as a very insecure culture. Protecting your ego. Prote yes. Protecting your face at all costs. So it doesn't matter what happens behind the scenes. As long as your public image is the best it can be. Why do you think a lot of non-Western countries don't value free speech? Why would they value something that could taint their image? And there's the difference in thinking. Mm -hmm. The West is individualistic and follows guilt culture where you have to stand up for your beliefs and fight for what you believe by being yourself. While the non-West adheres to shame culture, collectivism, conformity, where you need to be the same, where you need- So I guess he's explaining the difference, right? Western people get to be who they want to be themselves. And then basically you spend your whole life fighting to expand your power over other people or your influence of other people. Whereas in the Asian culture, you from the very day you are born, you are submitted to the elders and to their culture and their way of life. And there's no way you are allowed to have a distinguishing individuality there. I think that's his point. To make you and your family look good in front of the whole society. Because if you're not a good look, you're a dishonor and you're a shame. And this is what I'm trying to tell a bunch of Westerners. The whole world doesn't think like you. And some Westerners, especially Americans, will get very arrogant and want to change that. Why do you think America likes to meddle in other countries' business? Mm -hmm. They're trying to force guilt culture upon the whole world, telling people to fight for what they believe, when fighting for what you believe in those cultures could get you shamed. This is so true. This is a really valuable insight. What the US is doing, it is indeed, as he says, aggressively trying to impose our way of life, meaning the guilt principle-based or the rules-based order based on guilt, though, onto the rest of the world. But it will never work because these people are inherently different. So they try it the other way around by opening the borders, inviting millions and millions of immigrants coming to live with us in the West, trying to educate them, raise them as though they are one of ours, as though they are white people, raise them in an American guilt culture, but then you get this guy and he basically tells you, I suppose he was raised in the USA, but it doesn't work. He's still Asian. See, he still has that shame complex rather than the guilt complex. So you cannot, you cannot turn foreigners into us. Maybe that is a really sick thing about the Western world, though. In the Western world, we think we can make others into us because we assume we are the best. And it's not. We are unique in a sense but different from the rest of the world. And this is what I always try to explain to people, to Western people as well. We are different. Western people are psychologically different beings, right? We need to accept that, come to terms with it, accept that it's better to speak of the human race and white people. It's just see us, see ourselves as something separate from the rest of humanity, which would be a good things to us, uh, good things to us, by the way. Or it could be an awful look for you. It's literally about optics in the non-West. So in conclusion, the West is about individualism, standing out and fighting for what you believe, while yeah. the non-West is about collectivism, honor, yes. image, optics, reputation, and making sure you're not a bad look. That's so true. And then there's the Korean. All right, I'm going to flip to some, some more of his videos to see if there's some more interesting stuff that he's talking about. Okay, so if this I find is backwards something... logic. Because... Uh, no, it's too much. So the samurai... <laughs> and directly lead them to have this culture. It was actually embedded in their society Amazing that this video is up. Their Shinto faith. But actually, 
and a lot of people. <laughs> Read that comment. How did strictness in Asian societies, they mean, lead to Asians having a pedo culture? I think, what are they referring to? I didn't know that Asia had a pedo culture, by the way. And then they say, East Asians look more childlike. Oh, I think that's what they mean. Uh, the anime cartoons and so on, they have these very child-looking heroes. Maybe that's what they mean. Especially white Westerners are going to be very shocked about this. But I believe this culture is actually everywhere in Asia. And this is my theory why. Just look at my face. A lot of Asian faces are very childlike. The scientific term for that is neoteny, which means our faces have more childlike features and we keep those features as we age. Which is also why Asians seem so much younger than they actually are, and they don't seem to age like white people do, or any other race for that matter. And it's this neoteny, I believe, that shapes who men in our race are attracted to. I know it's a big generalization, and I certainly don't fall in that category. But really, it's not just Japanese culture. Look at yeah. Chinese. Hold on. The fact that East Asians look more childlike, it's called neoteny. Um, that also implies they are much more domesticated. I spoke about that earlier during the show. Domestication of people makes you more childlike. This is, after all, why dogs are so cute and wolves are still very vicious. Dogs are domesticated versions of wolves and leads also to dogs having more neoteny. The snout of a wolf is far, far, more extensive, far more extended than compared to most dogs, for example culture, Korean culture, Taiwanese culture, Vietnamese culture. Why do you think East Asian women always act cutesy cutesy, kawaii, <laughs> eggyo, while in any other part of the world that would seem like childish, babyish behavior? They would think, why would any man be attracted to that? Yeah, the, you know, the Asian women with the high pitched voices. Like, yeah, yeah. In their, no, I hate that. I can't stand it, actually. I don't, I, I don't, I don't like to have a woman with a, like, uh, like that Theranos CEO. Elizabeth Holmes, but you know, the high pitched voice when it's too high, they sound like babies, like children. That's not nice, you know. But for Asians, that's very, very attractive because it's very cute. And for the Asians out there, I'm really not trying to start a race war. I'm just trying to educate the non Asian people, a lot of them who tend to be ignorant, bring it on. About why something like this would possibly. Hey, happen. I'm smart. I listen to you. Now, by no means am I justifying this whatsoever. These people are sick and they should go to hell. And frankly, just like psychopaths, True. I just don't think these people should have rights. I'm joking. But seriously though, that's why the death penalty exists. That's why we should never abolish the death penalty. But anyways, to summarize, Asians physically look more like children than other races, which unfortunately has an impact on what men, especially East Asian men, are attracted to. Now again, just even saying that- All right, so this is very deep really. Very shocking, truthful. So let's see the if he has more. Ah, uh, oh, this is, is interesting. Narcissists. Whenever people complain about the 1%, or whenever when women or feminists say they hate all men, what does the 1% and the toxic men have in common? Narcissism. And narcissists will always exist. They're everywhere in TikTok. So no matter how much you try to change things, who's going to be in charge of that change? Normally, it's going to be a narcissist. It's a sad reality that narcissists rule the world because it takes a narcissist to take charge and make change. Almost yeah, every story. world leader in history is a narcissist. But a narcissist's worst nightmare is to be ignored and to be irrelevant. That's when you see them have narcissistic rage. And that's why Buddhism teaches that life really is just suffering. It's always gonna be suffering. When anyone tries to make a change in the world, there's always gonna be negative consequences. Uh, this is a good video, simply true. Uh, let's see, future primitive, says well scientists say that because that's because sci because of asian diets they have lower testosterone yeah they do eat a grain-based diet and a lot more soy which lowers your testosterone especially in japan they have like this massive soy culture it's not healthy you know? uh maybe i'll check one or two more videos of this guy because i've been streaming for almost an hour now and usually i wrap it up after an hour but a lot see. of capitalists uh no not this one so don't care currently Okay, this isn't that isn't as interesting. The free world. Wow, well, wow. Uh, as a Gen Z, <laughs> you're myself. Yeah, this may be true, but you know, Gen Z and Gen Alpha need to accept lower living standards. Yeah, they'll have to because the boomers own all the property, and they're going to give it to their to the millennials, 
and haha, Gen Z, Gen Alpha will have to rent from the millennials in the future. You know. Yes, soy does lower testosterone. It's not been debunked. But they're also genetically less masculine people, the Asians. But who knows, maybe they evolved under the influence of soy. Uh, three ways from nations to break free from the middle of the country. Oh, who cares, you know? So what do... Japan, So blah, a lot of foreign... All right, maybe, uh, okay, maybe I'll listen to this one. How the Tokugawa shogunate, or the samurai dictatorship, traumatized Japan, part two. So how did Tokugawa Ieyas usher in more than 300 years of peace and harmony by force? The ultimate sin in Japan is to inconvenience others, cause them trouble, or to be inconsiderate to them. Because causing other people trouble caused conflict. And conflict was just a few steps away from rebellion and outright chaos. Yeah, Tokugawa Ieyasu was very OCD about that. He wanted to make sure that the Japanese mindset was one of unity and cooperation. And so if anyone dared to inconvenience others or cause other people trouble, not to mention how the samurai created a feudal caste system with them at the top and the merchants at the bottom, even below the peasants, because the samurai knew money was a threat to their power. So that's how the samurai traumatized Japan, by literally controlling their behavior and doing social engineering. How the Tokugawa shogunate, or... All right, this is interesting. Uh, this you know, relates back to the point I made earlier that Asian people are simply more domesticated people, which is why they have higher IQs, more neoteny, more childlike faces, smaller bodies, and so on. Basically, the Asiatic people have been oppressed by a brutal upper caste, the samurai class, basically. You might even consider the samurai to be a foreign people, right? Like the like the Yamnaya in Europe, the the samurai people descend from a from a, a race of people who simply use the rest of the population as though they were cattle. You know, that's what it's really about. Uh, some people were asking for this guy's username. It's Kawalang Dalawahan. I posted it in uh, posted it in here, so. All right, I'm done watching this guy's videos. He has some very interesting takes. And of course, uh, I like to learn a lot from other people. So yeah, the Asian perspective. I'll put this video onto my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes. Um, and you can get to my, uh, let me type it out. Get to my Substack newsletter at www.jmk.info. Let's see what else do I have, you know, yeah subscribe to my TikTok because I'm going to do live shows probably every day now for an hour or so. All right, everybody. Have a nice evening. I'm going to log off. Like so. Bye-bye.